Okay, welcome back after the break. So before the break, we were looking at uh, you know, Paul's uh, command to Titus uh, to appoint uh, leaders, and now he gives him the qualifications of the leaders, and he is it's basically can be divided in four categories: uh, general qualification, uh, domestic qualification personal qualification and doctrinal qualifications, okay? So we look at uh, the domestic qualifications in verse 6. He says that he must be a blameless man. Blameless means one without. We already look at this in um, in uh, when Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy. And so blameless means a man who is without accusations, uh, he has no charges against him, uh, both in the church and in the world as well. Um, and uh, he must be a man who lives a righteous life and who can, you know, who can be seen uh, in a righteous living. His righteous living uh, is something that uh, will show to everybody that he is living a righteous life and uh, he can be chosen as a leader okay and we see that this word blameless stands ahead of the list of uh, uh, the qualities uh, that covers the whole of a leader's life um, so those qualifications and follow give uh, uh, the details which will test his blamelessness so he should be the husband of one wife that means uh, he must be uh, faithful to his wife and his affections should be uh, centered exclusively on his wife uh, you know must be having faithful children uh, in the greek here it uh, uh, can have a passive meaning which means uh, children who are trustworthy and dependable but it also has an active meaning which means children who are believing and trusting so Paul is saying that uh, the elders of the church must have children who believe in, in Jesus. Uh, and if it's his ability to lead the family, uh, uh, his own family in Christ's ways in them, uh, living in Christ likeness, uh, each one of them uh, believing in Christ and walking according to his righteous standards or living according to his righteous standards, then he will definitely be able to uh, lead the church of God or he'll be able to lead the family of uh, God. And so first, uh, his, his, uh, his, his ability to lead the church can only be seen or demonstrated in his ability to lead his own children and he says that uh, you know uh, faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination uh, dissipation means uh, you know the greek word uh, the meaning for this word means um, you know uh, those children who are not wild or self-indulgent uh, and living life in a wasteful manner uh, so that is the meaning of the word uh, dissipation. Uh, so they should not be accused of uh, living wild, uh, wasteful uh, uh, lives or lives that are self-indulging. Uh, and this word we see uh, mentioned in Luke chapter 15, uh, verse 13, uh, for how the prodigal son lived. He lived a riotous life, a riotous living of the prodigal son. So he says that they should not uh, live this, this kind of life. Uh, their children, the children of the elders should not live this kind of life. And also they must not be guilty of rebellion. That means they must, uh, uh, you know, submit to parental authority. And um, uh, if a man is able to train and govern his children, um, you know, he will be able to train and lead the flock of uh, God. But if he's not uh, able to lead and govern his own children, then it uh, will raise up a question or bring into question his ability to train and lead the flock of God. And in verse 7, he talks about the personal qualification of elders. Um, he says, um, 
uh, for a bishop uh, must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Now we see in this verse, there is a switch from the term elder to that of bishop. Uh, so the Greek word is for bishop is uh, epikpos, which means uh, a superintendent, guardian, and an overseer. Uh, so the apostle is basically talking about uh, someone in the same office as an elder, but now he moves to this term because it stresses the work or the function of elders or overseers. Now, why is he using this word bishop here? Even though bishop, elders, pastors, I said are terms that are used interchangeably, but he's using it here because it stresses the work or function of elders and overseers. So, you know, there is, uh, while there is dignity and honor uh, in this office as an elder or as a bishop or being appointed as a leader of uh, God's flock, uh, the focus is on their work uh, of, uh, you know, or the certain qualities of maturity, which are important for one's ability to uh, be effective stewards of what God has entrusted uh, to them. Okay, so even as we are, uh, you know, are in leadership position, even as some of us uh, are leaders, are pastors, um, you know, hold key leadership positions in the church. Yes, it is a place of uh, dignity, a place of honor, but it also, uh, you know, is a place of responsibility. And we need to, you know, um, live a life that is blameless, a life that is holy, uh, a life that is righteous, which can be seen by people. And also we need to have the qualities of maturity, uh, which will be able to help us to steward uh, the responsibility uh, uh, that God has given to us effectively and in a way that God wants uh, us to, uh, you know, use the responsibilities of the position that he's given to us and also bring him glory and honor uh, in the position that we are. Now, Paul continues with the list of qualifications. He says he must be a steward of God. Uh, steward, uh, the Greek word is oikonomos, uh, which refers to somebody who's manager of a household uh, or somebody who's managing household affairs. Um, so this word gives us an idea of uh, uh, appointment or the accountability and the responsibility and privileges uh, of, uh, of people who uh, are in a position to, you know, uh, are given uh, the blessings of God uh, and who are, you know, in a place where they uh, share their blessings uh, or uh, the good things that God has given uh, to others. So even as, um, you know, uh, God has blessed us with um, uh, spiritual blessings, material blessings, physical blessings, um, and God has showered his goodness and his favor on us, you know, uh, he wants to us to use it to share it with others and we learn this in um, in, uh, in in Timothy as well when Paul writes it to Timothy he says you know he's talking about money matters um, he says uh, you know godliness with contentment is great gain and then he talks about how important it is for us to share also uh, the resources that God has given uh, with others and so it uh, here's the word steward is um, gives us the idea or very strongly gives us the idea of um, uh, that we are accountable we are responsible to god uh, for the privileges that he has given to us and he has appointed us uh, not just to enjoy all of these benefits or blessings or his goodness uh, uh, for ourselves but also share it with others okay uh, and um, uh, the bishop should not be somebody who is self-willed, quick-tempered, not given to wine, should not be violent or greedy for um, money. Now, um, in all of these personal qualifications, you know, he's talking about negative uh, things. Uh, the personal qualifications fall into the negative. So what the elders must not do. Uh, and then he talks about the positives, what they should do in verses 8 and 9. Okay, so uh, 
so we see that in a Christian life, you know, uh, when we have accepted Jesus Christ as a person savior, we are under the power of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. His power operates in our life. It's not just, a, you know, a matter of positive and neg negative things, but it is about uh, a fruitful ministry to others. It's how fruitful and how effective our lives are in fulfilling God's purpose, fulfilling God's call, and how we serve him. Okay, so the person should not, the elder or the bishop should not be self-willed, uh, which means uh, not self-pleasing or arrogant, uh, uh, refusing to listen to others. Um, it basically talks about uh, that the person should not be self-centered. Um, uh, or somebody who's not wanting to have their way in everything uh, or also self-focused and being very proud. Not quick-tempered, uh, which means that, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's not, uh, just gets angry once in a moment, uh, once in a, in a while, or once, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 for some basic some occasions but uh, it's not about uh, uh, that kind of a person who rarely gets angry but you know uh, uh, you can just see his anger flare up in in, in one or two occasions uh, but it's talking about somebody who is constantly you know uh, throwing up fits of rage or anger uh, for every little thing so even if you don't have to react in a very angry way this person can um, you know uh, get angry okay so it's like a settled state of anger it's not just flash of occasional bad temper but somebody who's constantly getting angry and uh, somebody who's using every occasion to uh, you know get back at uh, or use his anger to get back at people uh, who have uh, wronged them or who have a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, come against them. So using every opportunity to get back at them. So it is basically talking about somebody who is uh, constantly angry and who feeds his anger against uh, others. And not given to wine, so he's not, uh, should not be addicted to wine, not a heavy drinker, uh, the Greek word is para onios. Uh, para means alongside, and onios means wine. So it means here basically uh, somebody who does not sit along with his wine and gets drunk, and uh, but is under the control of the spirit. It's not under the control of uh, uh, wine, but is under the control of the Holy Spirit, that like we read in Ephesians chapter five, verse eight. It should not be violent. Uh, violent means, uh, you know, uh, refers to somebody who's quick at using his hand or his fist uh, to strike somebody um, uh, or is prone to violence very quickly. So the term looks at anger, which is totally out of control and goes beyond just verbal or uh, 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 saying things, uh, uh, verbal abuse to physical abuse. So somebody who's not just getting angry with, uh, you know, by using his words, but also somebody who's physically abusing the other person uh, and goes totally out of control and uh, goes beyond what he or she should be uh, doing by just uh, getting physical and um, you know striking the their opponent not greedy for money we uh, you know paul also talks about this in first timothy chapter 3 where he says um, uh, or he's t telling uh, timothy that the elders are to be free from the love of money and we uh, we uh, learned there that uh, you know uh, making money in the right means uh, or earning money in the right way is not wrong uh, and having money is also not evil but it's a love for money that is a root of all kind of evil that we saw and read in first timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and uh, 10. so you know those who love money are those who are always uh, thinking about how to make more and more and they're concerned about laying up treasures on earth rather than laying up treasures in uh, heaven uh, rather than working for the kingdom of god and then he moves on to talk about the positive qualifications in verse 8 he says they should be hospitable 
you know why is hospitality mentioned here is because uh, uh, you know at those times when uh, in Paul's times you know um, believers they used to travel and they could not stay in the homes of unbelievers or inns because they would be exposed to insult danger and persecution because of their faith so it was important for fellow believers to offer them hospitality even as these believers traveled um, and it was also further necessary because uh, Christians were often persecuted and they were rendered homeless and so you know uh, the other believers would have to take them into their homes give them shelter uh, provide them food and all their basic uh, needs uh, but we see that that's not the case today uh, but you know we do have people who are persecuted uh, we are uh, living in a world where uh, things are changing uh, you know if you look at the current scenario we also see the war in ukraine uh, there's so many millions of them who are going to be refugees no homes no place to go no jobs so you know uh, it's important that um, you know, as a body of that, the body of Christ uh, demonstrates hospitality and care for people uh, at their times of need. Uh, and it talks about uh, a bishop or an elder should be somebody who is uh, a lover of what is good. They're devoted to things that are good, that is beneficial. Uh, it should be good or beneficial either in word or deeds or in also their giving of their resources, their money, their blessings and their things. Uh, should be sober-minded. Now, what is the meaning of sober-minded? Uh, somebody who is able to think clearly, think with clarity. Um, and here it's it's somebody who can who values the things of God and does not cheapen the ministry or the gospel message by foolish behavior. So when we act foolishly, behave foolishly, making the wrong choices, uh, or uh, you know we do things to get um, uh, you know because we can get benefits of people, favor of church people, uh, you know be under their good. Uh, books so to say or their uh, good um, thoughts uh, we can live or we can uh, do things according to what they want and what appeases them or what pleases them but then you know we will be cheapening the ministry or the gospel message by our foolish behavior um, the soundness of mind and sound mind thinking comes from knowing and living in the light of the word of God. Okay, so the more that we abide in the wine, the more that we, uh, you know, feed on God's word, the more our thinking uh, is sound, uh, and we know what is right, what is wrong. We will do the the right things, and it will be seen in the right choices, the right attitudes, the right behavior patterns that we are living. So it affects our values, our attitudes our pursuits it also helps us to live uh, or bring our uh, uh, ourselves under self-control and this is all to the work of the spirit even as we read god's word even as we commune and fellowship uh, with god and his word um, daily okay and in the mind of the apostle paul uh, this was an important quality in a leader okay and then he says that uh, should be just holy and self-control so a pastor a teacher an elder a bishop must be just that means just is towards men in their justice being just treating everyone with fairness with justice holy means a uh, right towards god uh, uh, living holy and pleasing lives uh, acceptable and honoring in god's self, uh, sight uh, self-control means a right towards uh, themselves or himself okay so uh, just is just right toward men holy is right towards god and self-control is right towards himself now this word self-control in greek refers to strength or power that is needed to restrain or control one's passion and we know that this is one of the fruit of the spirit uh, and is to be the result uh, and it uh, and the fruits of the, the fruit of the spirit will be evident in our lives uh, only when we are under the spirit's control or we are walking under the control of the holy spirit we are living under the control of the holy spirit we are um, 
abiding in the vine, we are feeding on God's word. Um, or, you know, we are consecrating our lives daily on the altar for God to sanctify us, for the Holy, Holy Spirit to sanctify us. To that extent, we are sanctified. To that extent, we see the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives. Um, so uh, self-control life is really um, uh, the, uh, the life uh, that we live under the control or under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it is equipped with a life, uh, a life filled with the word. Uh, okay, and uh, so it's uh, living under the guidance and the control of the Holy Spirit and under, uh, you know, a, a life that is uh, living according to God's word. That means when we are filled with God's word, we will automatically know what to do and we will be walking and living according to God's word. Okay, the doctrinal qualification um, uh, in, verses, in verse 9 says, hold fast the faithful word so like we looked in the previous verse it says we, we will be equipped with life filled with the word uh, like we see it here now demonstrated for us it says like holding fast the faithful word uh, and this means um, to study to know and to live by what the scripture tells us it is to study know and live by the bible uh, which is God's faithful message to his people. And it is also to defend God's word uh, or to defend uh, uh, the Bible against attacks uh, that will be waged against it. Uh, uh, because we know that uh, in the past we have seen uh, people have, uh, you know, spoken against God's truth in this word, tried to destroy God's word. Uh, the many attacks will come against God's word, uh, false doctrines, false teachers. Uh, but we need to be good stewards of God's word, thoroughly equipped so that we can, uh, you know, defend God's word, uh, uh, defend the special revelation that God has uh, given to man. So a leader must be sure, you know, uh, uh, make sure that uh, they are faithfully studying God's word for themselves, uh, growing in God's word, growing the revelation that comes out of God's word. Um, uh, and so when he preaches or teaches God's word to people, uh, he can do this with great confidence and authority uh, and not just do it, uh, you know, uh, with doubts, uh, with some theological guesswork, uh, with doubts that he might be having. But uh, first studying God's word, uh, knowing the truths for themselves, having clarity um, so that they can explain the truth, the revelation, the the doctrines, the theology in God's word uh, to people a, a, in a confident and an authoritative way and not just do some guesswork or, you know, have some doubts, but just uh, teach what you know. Okay. And it also means that a leader should stick to God's word instead of just uh, focusing on the current trends or what people, what uh, messages people want to hear, prosperity, gospel, blessings, all of those things, uh, or based on the programs of the church, but teach them the solid truth from God's word. Even as Paul, you know, uh, 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 encourages Timothy to do the same thing, he is telling uh, Titus as well. Okay. Uh, and he's saying, uh, hold fast the faithful word uh, as he has been taught. So uh, it means that the elder, uh, you know, um, uh, should be under the teaching of uh, someone else who uh, who sound in their doctrine, sound in their faith, sound in God's word, in the theology of God's word. It does not necessarily mean here that the leader has to go to a Bible college or a seminary to learn or study, but they do need to be taught and discipled by someone uh, and not just themselves, but they need to be taught by somebody who is uh, a good steward of God's word, sound in the doctrine, sound in the faith, um, and the theology in God's word. And why should he be taught? So that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So a godly leader uh, 
if he has sound foundation in God's word, you know, uh, he can use God's word to exhort, that means encourage, strengthen, build, uh, mature people in the faith, and also refute those who are um, bringing, uh, the, uh, those refute false teachers, false doctrines um, that are coming up, okay? Um, so we see that uh, this is uh, the elder's responsibility. They need to have the ability to, uh, you know, use the sound foundation, solid foundation they have received in God's word to both teach and preach and to exhort and to uh, build up people in the faith and also to refute those who are, uh, you know, um, uh, bringing about false doctrines and false teachings that is against the God's word, okay? And he says here that um, to exhort and convict, um, he says that he may be able by sound doctrine, okay? Sound doctrine is, um, uh, you know, um, a doctrine that is correct uh, and according to uh, 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 the, the doctrine that is in God's word. So a godly leader deals with those who contradict and uh, he does it with sound doctrine. Uh, he does not use his own authority uh, and not in an arrogant way. Uh, he does not use his position or his authority in an arrogant way to bring correction, but in a humble way, he uses uh, the teachings, the truth of God's word uh, uh, to refute those who are uh, you know, um, teaching or propagating the false doctrines. Uh, so to convict, he says, means, um, uh, to, you know, to convince, to reprove, to rebuke, uh, which means it is to convince or rebuke someone in such a powerful um, and effective way with the truth in God's word, which will lead them either to confess uh, or at least be convicted of sin so the main reason to convict the person is to uh, you know convince them uh, to reprove them of their wrong so that uh, you know they would know it will lead them to know the truth and confess uh, the truth uh, and uh, uh, you know at, or at least be convicted of their sin of uh, believing the lies and the false teachings and then he says that uh, you know um, uh, the elder must be able to teach the sound doctrine, uh, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Okay, so the Greek word here means those who refuse, uh, who answer again, who deny and speak against the truth in God's word. Now, there will always be people who stand up against and oppose the sound teaching of scripture. And, uh, you know, uh, the church leaders, elders, pastors, um, uh, who are not able to teach or defend the truth of, uh, uh, you know, the scripture against those who attack it, uh, you know, would uh, uh, would then leave their uh, people under their care or the flock under their care open uh, to the false teaching. And so it is very important that a pastor and elder uh, is able to uh, not only teach the truth, but also defend um, the truth of the scripture against those who attack it okay and paul says even as you do this uh, titus you need to do this with uh, gentleness and reverence so the times that we are living now we would have we are having a lot of false teachings uh people who propagate these false teachings uh, but you know we need to defend the truth in god's word uh we do this with the hope that uh, they will be convicted of their sin uh they will come to realize the truth but we need to do it in a gentle way and with a reference okay then he talks about the characteristics of false teachers in verses 10 to 16 can one of you please read 10 to 16 please can one of you please read 10 to 16 thomas can you read 10 to 16 
Is anyone in class? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Can I read? Yeah, thank you, Siddharth. Yeah. For there are many rebellious people in Mary Taker's and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will, they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Thank you, Siddharth. So here, uh, he's talking about, uh, you know, the characteristics of uh, the false teachers. So they're just like uh, the church at Ephesus. Uh, there were a lot of false teachers here also at Crete. There were false teachers. And so he says that these false teachers are many, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Apostle uh, Paul is uh, saying that there are many who stand opposed to the truth in verse 9 and in verse 14. He says there are many who stand opposed to the truth. And um, he says these uh, uh, false teachers are insubordinate. Okay, that means they're not willing to submit to God's order of authority. Uh, you know, God has established an order of authority in several different areas of our life. Uh, there's an order of authority in the home, uh, the church, the workplace, and in the community. Uh, so we all know who is, uh, you know, the authoritative figure at home, in the church, in our workplace, in our community. And uh, God wants us not only to recognize the authority that he's placed in our lives, but he also wants to submit us to submit to that authority. Okay, and so here we see that these false teachers firstly are insubordinate. They don't submit to the authoritative structure that God has placed in the church. Then secondly, he says that they are idle talkers. That means they, um, they all they do is empty talking because uh, their talk is basically about fictitious tales, uh, you know, uh, tales about Adam, Moses, Elijah, and other Old Testament saints, uh, which are not true stories, made up stories. Uh, they also want to follow, uh, you know, legalistic and uh, uh, ascetic, that means very severe rules. Uh, uh, and regulations like Old Testament, uh, you know, food that they have to eat, the way they have to eat it, circumcision rituals, and all other uh, rituals that uh, they want uh, the people or believers in the church to uh, follow. And if anyone rejects or stands uh, opposed to the grace message of God's truth, as it's revealed in Christ and it's found for us in the scripture, you know, their words will be without power, just futile discussions that cannot lead to any spiritual growth, freedom, peace, or deliverance that God gives to us in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay, so uh, if anyone speaks anything other than uh, you know the the truth in God's word uh, revealed to us in Christ, then we see their words or their teachings are without power. It's basically idle, empty talk. Uh, which will not benefit anyone, which will not strengthen them uh, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, and will also not uh, help them inherit any blessings. Um, so it's important for elders, pastors, all of us as uh, stewards of God's word who have been entrusted with the treasure of God's word, you know, to hold fast the faithful message uh, in God's word. And, uh, and this alone has the power to change lives. It's God's word. God's word is power. God's word is truth. And Jesus says in John chapter 17 that uh, your, your word, which is truth, will sanctify them. Okay, so the 
word of God sanctifies and cleanses us. It also gives us the power uh, to speak things in the natural and we can see the supernatural happen. We can see things in, uh, we can speak things in the natural and we can see miracles and we can see the promises of God uh, uh, become a reality in our lives. And he says that these um, uh, false teachers, you know, uh, are deceivers, okay? He talks about them as uh, de deceivers. Um, uh, they are those who uh, very craftily, because you know it's the work of Satan. So very, very subtly, very craftily, very nicely, they deceive the mind of others as well as their own uh, minds themselves. They are deceived, and um, you know they are empty talkers, uh, but the, they, you know, appear to be very clear, very impressive in the way they say things. But all they are saying is just empty because it's not the power of God does not have the the uh, the power the power of God attested to it. It's not the source is not from God, and hence uh, it is empty uh, words. Okay. Um, and also he says that uh, these people are deceivers because they are only people who merely talk but don't do. They only tell others what to do, but they don't do it themselves. And, um, and the greatest tragedy is that people get easily deceived by their false doctrines because it is you know, so sweet, so nice to listen, so pleasing to the ears. Uh, and they appear to be so clear and impressive. They impress people's hearts and minds um, but actually that you know they are far away from the truth um, and they are people who are peddlers of error uh, because you know they themselves are deceived by satan they deceive others uh, themselves and so um, uh, paul is telling them uh, telling timothy teaching things they ought not to teach these people uh, these false teachers are ones who uh, teach things that they are not supposed to be teaching and he says he who are these uh, so called false teachers he says these especially those of the circumcision now the esv um, Easy Standard Version says, you know, some Jewish followers, the Passion Translation says, uh, those who are converts from Judaism. So here it's giving us a clue or an identity about uh, who these uh, false teachers were, uh, who were troubling the believers at Crete. Uh, they were basically the Jewish Christians, uh, or those who are Jews, who, be, who put their faith in, in Jesus, who uh, you know, now became part of the church, uh, they insisted that circumcision was necessary for salvation. So they were bringing in all of these Jewish mythologies, fables, genealogies, uh, things that were not real, teaching it to people, and also you know, bringing about all these legalistic rituals and laws that uh, they required people to uh, keep. And one of them was circumcision. And in verse 11, Paul says, you know, they, uh, these people's mouth must be stopped. Uh, so he says, just as there's a moral necessity for elders to be men who firmly hold the truth in God's word, like we read in verse 9, uh, and also there is a moral necessity for these men to silence the false teachers. That means they need to keep them quiet. Don't give them an opportunity to, to preach or teach in the church or to the people in the church. Um, so uh, he's saying that you, uh, the elders' responsibility is to silence uh, false teachers. Um, and then he says that they must be stopped. The Greek word here means to cover the mouth with something or to silence. Uh, so there are two, at least two responsibilities here. Uh, the offenders must be uh, refused opportunity to spread their teachings in the churches. And it also, uh, this, this word uh, stopped also means uh, that they must be silenced by, uh, you know, uh, teaching them or opposing their views by, um, uh, you know, uh, by teaching them the right doctrines and also silencing them uh, by making them spread, spread uh, uh, or denying them, uh, you know, uh, the 
the opportunity to spread this uh, uh, their false teaching with other people in the church uh, Otherwise, it will weaken the church, it will weaken the house of God, and it will weaken family life. And then he says that these false teachers, they do not convert people to the truth, but they subvert. Now, this, mean, this word vert means turn. Okay, so subvert means to overturn or to overthrow. So uh, the, the stress here is on the disastrous effects uh, on the families or on the house churches. So Paul is saying, if you just give these people the opportunity, you know, to teach or preach, uh, or, or if they're not silenced, uh, or if they're not stopped from spreading uh, their false teaching, you know, it will it'll have disastrous effects uh, on the families or, uh, you know, the house churches. So when he's talking about households here, it could refer to the house churches because in those days people met in the houses of various uh, members of the church. So there were house churches or families of the church. So any which ways it would have a disastrous uh, influence uh, on, the, on the church or on the families. And he says that these false teachers do it for dishonest gain. Their motive is basically not to let people know that what they're believing is the truth so the people can live by the truth, the truth can change their lives, they can be benefited by the truth. But their main motive is uh, to teach these false teaching is to make money. Okay, And they did not uh, really care what people really believed as long as they made money. Okay. And uh, we read in verse 11, uh, the verse 11 points us to the nature of uh, the seductive activities of these false teachers uh, uh, and why they need to be silenced because their motive is dishonest gain. Their method is teaching what ought not to be taught. That means the false doctrines. And the multiple result is misleading whole families. So why is Paul using the strong word that they must be silenced uh, or their mouths to be closed? Uh, you know, it's because that uh, the methods of these um, the motive of these false teaching teachers is for dishonest gain, just to make money. They don't care what the people believe, what they don't believe. The method is teaching what they should not be teaching. And the result is that they are misleading whole families. Okay. And in verse 12, Paul, uh, you know, quotes one of uh, 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 a, uh, a line from a poetry written by uh, Epimendus, uh, who was a poet from Crete. He was a Cretan poet. Uh, and so he had written in one of his uh, poems that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy uh, gluttons. Uh, so why is Paul quoting him here? Because he's trying to avoid uh, being blamed as an anti-Cretan or talking bad or ill about the people of Crete. So when he's pointing uh, an, uh, a person from Crete who talks about his own people like this, then he says, that you know, um, you know, uh, yes, people at Crete, these false teachers, um, are not just liars, but they're always liars. They're not beasts, but evil beasts, and they're not just gluttons, but lazy gluttons. That means they don't want to work hard to earn their money. They just want to use these false teachings and doctrines um, and bring about these legalistic rituals so that they can earn money. OK, so by pointing out this basic bad character of these Cretans, um, uh, it was important uh, for Titus to understand why he has to appoint uh, leaders to lead the church. And it's also important for the church to know what kind of leaders uh, should, uh, you know, be in, in positions of authority uh, to lead the church. Uh, if these congregations were left to themselves, then, you know, there would be utter chaos and confusion and there would be uh, uh, errors uh, or false teaching and doctrines that will dominate the church. Okay. 
And in verse 13, he says, This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And this testimony is true. He, he's agreeing with the poet Epimenthus' uh, statement that is true. And then he's telling Titus, therefore rebuke them uh, sharply. That means he's saying rebuke those who are found guilty of uh, teaching these false doctrines. Uh, rebuke them um, and, uh, you know, with this hope that they will be convinced, that means they would know what their teaching is wrong. Uh, uh, they would uh, be able to confess their sin and walk in the truth. Okay, uh, so rebuke them sharply. Um, um, okay, and do this uh, in a serious way. And this is because this is very serious. Uh, because the serious nature of false teaching and the character of the false teachers, this has to be done sharply okay we looked at what was the false teachers what was their teaching uh, what are the characteristics and uh, because this is a serious matter he says it has to be done sharply sharply means uh, severely or rigorously a sharp rebuke uh, you know only a sharp rebuke will get the attention of these false teachers uh, otherwise the problem will continue okay um and then he says that they may be sound in the faith. So when you rebuke them sharply, do this with the hope that, uh, or with the result that they will be sound, they will be whole, healthy in the doctrine, in their faith, uh, in their foundations. Uh, and the goal of rebuke is to restore them. And uh, Paul's hope was to bring uh, the Cretan believers to wholeness in their faith. Uh, you know, they had a sick belief system. They needed uh, uh, to be restored to the truth that would help them to, uh, you know, become healthy in their uh, faith. And um, likewise, it is a goal of each one of us, whether we are uh, preachers, teachers, missionaries, or teaching children or youth, um, that the people under our care that God has entrusted to us, that uh, we teach and lead and preach or minister to them so that they will come to a place of sound faith. They will be grounded in their faith, in their walk, and they will mature uh, in God. And verse 14, he says, um, don't give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth so he says uh, um, to be sound in faith demands that the Cretan believers give up two belief systems Jewish fables I told you about the Jewish fables and the commandments of men that means uh, you know following the rituals Jewish rituals and laws uh, which is not necessary uh, and uh, if they follow these commandments, they will be following the commandments of men rather than follow, following the commandments of God because uh, uh, salvation is by grace through faith and it's not by something uh, that we can earn by doing good works or keeping the law because the law could not save us. The law could not um, deliver us from our sins. The law could not uh, uh, provide us a way out for salvation, but it is, um, it is only our faith in Jesus Christ okay uh, so he says you know um, uh, don't give heed to f f Jewish fables and commandments uh, of men who turn people away from the truth and in verse 15 he says the pure all things are pure to those who are defiled and believe unbelieving nothing is pure but even their mind and consciences are uh, defiled okay uh, so we'll stop here. We'll look at uh, verse 15 and verse 16 uh, in the next class. Okay. Uh, any questions anyone has? Any questions, any doubts? No? Okay. If not, uh, we'll end class here. Thank you all for joining class and I'll see you uh, next Wednesday. Okay, thank you.